helmet. Oh, wait, I've got it on the bar, though. Good to be with you all. Um, I confess when I was invited to um, spend some time with you tonight, I was um, I surprised and impressed that there was such a an organisation of uh, of uh, thoughtful and hardy souls who were giving up their time to uh, play your minds and efforts to try and improve the, uh, I guess, the design and operation of our, our society. So first, I just want to acknowledge and recognise you all for the um, the wisdom of that endeavour and the um, just making that choice to participate in something like this. So I'm very pleased to meet you and happy to support your endeavour. Um, as we become clear, I um, uh, we're kindred spirits in, in respect of what I understand you're trying to achieve. Uh, just, just by way of an introduction, I think it's important for you to understand where um, I'm coming from uh, on the topic in, in hand. And, um, it'll, it'll help to explain um, some of the answers to the questions about what's actually going on and what's driving this, this work here in Puriwu around our Puriwu uh, I guess the first observation I'd make is that we were all reminded very recently <coughs> that the uh, nearly catastrophic um, um, protest that uh, played out in a parliament in recent times, that, you know, that our civil society is, is a fiction that's only given flesh, made real by the consent of the governed. And that, um, you know, I think a salutary lesson for us all is that if a significant enough portion of the, um, of the, of the governed withdraw their consent to participate in our, in our civil processes, then um, it all starts to break down and get ugly real quick. That's a, um, a non-trivial observation, I think, for us all. Um, going back in time, uh, to, to um, sort of come forward as to how we've landed where, we, where, where we're at. I guess the first observation I'd make from Ngāti Tō's perspective was really connected with the, uh, really connected with the pandemic. Um, uh, December, early December 2020, you know, the government with the support of the team of 5 million had established Fortress New Zealand and we were, you know, uh, smiling uh, uh, behind our behind our doors, at the rest of the world, um, we were struggling with the uh, catastrophe of the pandemic in various uh, locations, and I was invited to participate in a workshop uh, by the Ministry of Health to brainstorm how it is that um, how it is that we might, as a community nationwide, in due course, get something like a universal uptake in connection with two things. One was COVID tracing at that time, there was no tracing solution or program for its implementation, but it was recognized that that would be something that would be needed. And how do we how do we do that as a nation and get something like an ubiquitous or universal uptake of that? And the second uh, topic that we were brainstorming to get universality on was around the eventual vaccine rollout program. Um, how, do we, how do we achieve that? Um, early in the workshop, I, I posed the question, can anyone think of any public policy outcome that, that even approximates to universality or, or ubiquity? And it was a bit of a shock to everybody, myself included, um, that none of us could think of a single public policy outcome that, that was even remotely universally uh, available to all New Zealanders. Now, I have to say that that came as a bit of a shock. We couldn't think of anything. Fresh water, no. Education, no. Healthy food, no. Nothing. Employment, education, nothing. Uh, immediately for me, when my mind went with that was, if we don't, if we can't find any example of um, a universally available public policy outcome, it must be systemic. It must be the fact that um, our, our constitutional arrangements, our machinery of government, are not designed to deliver universal outcomes. So I pose that as a as a um, question and a challenge to the to the workshop, and we deliberated on it for a little while, and we concluded pretty quickly. Yeah, that's a fair cop. Uh, and, and I just would. Uh, invite you to pause for a tick and think about what I just said. 
our machinery of government, our, our constitutional arrangements and our machinery of government is not designed to deliver universal anything. So it doesn't matter how clever you are, how big hearted you are, how much budget you appropriate systemically, and we can go into what some of the examples of the systemic failures are. Systemically, the hypothesis was you will not be able to get ubiquity of, of social outcomes. Uh, it was a jaw-dropping conclusion for me personally, and I think for most people in the workshop. Later that summer, as I was um, lying around the pool trying to relax in preparation for 2021, um, I, I, I pondered why that, how the blazes that had arisen. And it occurred to me on reflection that as recent as my, my grandfather's youth uh, and young adulthood, he was born in 03, um, the majority of the world was ruled by emperors and kings. Uh, that in my mother's youth and young adulthood, it was still uh, largely ruled by kings and now a bunch of uh, dictators, both from the left and the right, uh, with only a few fledging uh, democracies. And it's actually only been in my slash our lifetime uh, that democracy has actually been anything like um, the norm. But of course, because it has dominated our lives, we, we and our children um, think that it's always been thus, but it hasn't. And in fact, it's only a relatively recent um, addition to the way generally around the world societies are organized. As I thought about that a little bit further, with really only the, the, only the Yanks, only the Americans really uh, started that experiment, a democracy that is with the idea of government by the people, for the people. Um, my take on the history of democracy in the Westminster version and, and many of the others was, it was really about wrenching power off the sovereign uh, to empower, you know, first the lords and then the landed class and what have you. And then we get down to our, our you know, 19th, 20, 21st century version of it. It still carries many of the characteristics of that journey of wrenched power. And so anyway, the point being is that we, we, we live with, in this land as well as most others, with a version one, of democracy. It actually hasn't been around that long. And unsurprisingly, given its its origins from emperors and kings, um, it, its its primary design, uh, I, I think, um, is mostly around checks and balances, control of power, which is understandable given where it came from. It's about risk management, it's about the um, securing and aggregation of resources and their application and accountability for their application and so on and so forth. But what it isn't clearly, I would argue, is about um, ensuring that uh, the public policy outcomes that are decided upon to be in the best interest of the society are universally available because they are. So, so those were all very sobering reflections for me, and it was shortly thereafter I had a virtual knock on the door um, from the good people of um, uh, the People Speak, and um, I had a hoodie with, with them. And they introduced me to some related ideas around deliberate democracy and around climate change and, and a citizen's assembly to address climate change and made the suggestion to me or invited me to on behalf of Ngāti Tōtū, participate in a Wellington-wide citizens' assembly on the climate change kaupapa. And as I, as I asked, as they explained to me what a citizens' assembly was, and I saw the power of the concept, um, I, I, I made a counter-proposal, which was that um, instead of having a Wellington-wide uh, citizens' assembly, that we narrow the uh, regional or, or geographic location to put into a city. Uh, reasons were, from my perspective, um, that um, uh, um, that, that the locale of public policy outcome is just any governmental, any government public policy, you know, is for a purpose to deliver education, to house the people, to ensure adequate income, etc. Um, that, that's what I meant by public policy outcome. 
Um, so coming back to the, the my counter proposal to to um, the people speak whanau, um was that if we focused on Purirua, um, uh, my my challenge was that the or my my idea was that the um, uh, community is a lot more discreet and and um, you know easier to engage uh, as belonging to a a, a, a a you know a smaller location. The local government is someone that we have a, has an established strong relationship with, so I felt that you know we could more easily and confidently have them participate. And then, of course, from Ngāti Tō's perspective, um, uh, Purirua uh, is, is our uh, core uh, takiwā o rohe, our traditional area, uh, uh, and we wouldn't need to be having um, you know, conversations with other iwi who, would, who have an interest in the Wellington, wider Wellington region. So anyway, that, that, they thought that was a good idea, and we decided that that's, that would be the scope of our endeavour, the forming up of a citizens' assembly on a on a treaty basis uh, between Mana Whenua, Ngāti Tua, and the, the, the community, the Tangata Tūriti, and, and we would work together to come up with a model for um, a, a citizens' assembly which would focus on the climate change kaupapa. So, so we met a few times and um, as, as Simon alluded to, it culminated in a workshop with a number of invited community leaders to um, share with them the idea and to discuss uh, and, and see where it might take us and see if there was support for it. We, we landed in an extraordinary place that for me personally was entirely unexpected. What, what I thought would happen is we'd, yep, it's a good idea. Let's let's we'll, we'll lean in on that. Let's organise it, and away we go. That that was pretty much all I was expecting. Um, but the discussion moved to a place that um, I think has fundamentally strengthened uh, the experiment. So. Uh, towards the end, the group that I was in, uh, with, with, which had a number of Pacific leaders, um, they made the observation that in the uh, broader Pacific community around the Pacific Islands, Fiji, Tonga, uh, Samoa, etc., that uh, there is a, a forum, a concept for uh, deliberative discussion, a forum for that called a Talanoa, uh, or, or to, to Talanoa, and it is called a Talanoa, which, which is interestingly found, as I say, across the Pacific. And so the observation was made by these Pacific leaders that there's nothing new about community leaders deliberating uh, for the purpose of, of uh, identifying and agreeing how best to deal with uh, issues that relate to the community. And as we, we thought about that, the idea and the power of us establishing a standing committee, a talanoa in Purirua that would enable community leaders across our city to on some agreed basis to, to come together and to deliberate uh, on issues positively or whatever. Um, that resonated, we liked that. And um, further in that discussion, the um, specific mechanism of a citizens assembly, and I'm, I'll assume everyone in this forum knows what a citizens assembly is, uh, 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 that, that, uh, that uh, in the event that in our community, the mechanism of a citizens assembly um, is needed to augment the uh, deliberations, decision-making and action-taking of our Porirua Talanoa, we, we would um, establish one, we would call for one, we'd, we'd run one. Uh, uh, so, and we ended up adopting the language of the Tangata Whenua, the Wānanga. So, so we came up with the idea of a Talanoa Wānanga, where the Talanoa, as I say, is a standing committee for, uh, that meets on some regular basis, where community leaders uh, who have a constituency uh, are inclusively invited to, um, to, to come together um, and, and to deliberate and discuss and, and agree and act. Um, uh, 
and that that Tullinor Forum would be augmented periodically by the operation of a Wananga or a Citizens Assembly. And the first one that, that we, we would um, run is, is the, the climate change Wananga uh, to, to learn uh, and to, um, yeah, to learn uh, from that process. So that's, that's where we got to roughly. And the energy for it, um, I would say, really came from the came from the fact that, and this links back to my earlier reflections from the lessons from from our COVID um, experience, is that what what I think we've all observed is that uh, central government and to some extent actually local government as well operates uh, almost unavoidably, I would say, certainly by design currently, in a top-down manner. And th their ability to actually get right down to the grassroots of our community for a range of practical reasons, um, uh, they're not able to deliver on that. And so what we saw during the pandemic is that if we wanted to get um, ubiquity, if we wanted to get universality of anything, that you have to inform, engage, empower, and resource the community to participate. And that's the only time and the only way uh, over the last two years that we have been able to get anything like, like universality of anything. So with that in mind, the idea that here in Porirua we would stand up a, we'd, we'd run a safe to fail experiment in, in in a community uh, 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 community governance and commun of itself and, and, and leadership uh, uh, through this Tullamore process, it really resonated with, with me and others there. And the addition of the power of the deliberative process, the Citizens Assembly to the, to the ecosystem, yeah, really resonated well. Really. Now we would have run it, the first one by now, uh, except COVID, Precluded that we were planning to have it before Christmas, and then all of the traffic lights and what have you since then have, have um, precluded us being able to run that. So we're, we're now just taking our time to carefully plan it for as soon as possible. Probably May June is realistic as the first time because we, it's not it, it's not sensible that we do it uh, virtually um, for a range of reasons, including the inclination of the communities that we um, that are here in Porirua. And so we'll, we'll call that uh, first one, say, for May, June. And, I, and I'll just conclude with some, some uh, uh, thoughts about what we're expecting. Of course, at this stage, we, it, we have very little that's nailed down. Um, I've, I've said the intention is to invite, uh, sorry, I've said the intention is for the Talanoa to be a forum for uh, community leaders who have a constituency. Now that's obviously a spectrum, you know, you can have a constituency or one. Uh, and so there'll, there'll need to be discussion uh, and agreement reached on, on, on the parameters for our Talanoa. But that's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll work that up. In the first instance, the community leaders who are invited along, uh, are on pretty, we're on pretty safe ground that, that, that they are, uh, want better description, legitimate community leaders. But it's not obvious to me why it can't be um, very, very inclusive. Um, and that it's not obvious to me why we would want to limit it other than from a practical point of view. Clearly, there's going to be some um, learning to be had in terms of, you know, our, how we run it, what our tikanga, our rules, our engagement, our, how we cheer and all the rest of it. At this stage, Ngāti Tō is the one that's putting up the karanga or the call for people to come and participate in it. It is going to be framed up as a, uh, as a treaty-based uh, enterprise. Uh, 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 in the first instance, that it will be first Talanoa will be held at in the, uh, the large uh, Farikai or the Eden Hall at Takapuahia Marae in, 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 in Takapuahia in Porirua. Um, it's a large enough venue. Uh, I'll cheer it, and you know, but that will just be for starters. Um, and uh, yeah, and we'll 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 decide as we go on the parameters for for its operation. Uh, I guess just lastly on the Wananga side, the Citizens Assembly, but we will be reliant on the expertise of our of our uh, friends 
uh, from the people speak and the others that they are connected with who will come in, guide us, uh, and and um, take a you know a, a clear uh, leadership role in terms of the establishment and operation of our first uh, go at our one on, on the climate change co-papa. Um, but I, I, I do see it all as a exciting safe to fail experiment in enhanced democracy, uh, in enhanced local participation in the in the governance and operation of our of our community. And if I could just finish on on this one observation. As, as important as it is to, to, to have better processes for deciding who decides, I mean, that, that's, you know, that's what democracy is all about, is deciding who decides. Um, and as important as that is, in my view, that's only part of the experiment. My observation around the COVID experience uh, and the, the lessons of the last two years is that um, while improved machinery of government uh, of democratic processes is, is, is vital for us to get to our version two, ideally, of New Zealand's democracy. I, I think um, equally uh, as important is that we uh, concurrently uh, uh, get a change in our operating model, i.e. how do we deliver on the decisions that our improved um, democracy serves up because the observation that I've made a few times now is that it's really only through the appropriate involvement, information, uh, empowerment, and resourcing of the community that you actually get anything that approximates the universal. So that's what we're about, and why are we doing it? Because, in our estimation, uh, our overall aspiration to do everything we can to enhance the well-being, prosperity and mana of our people and community, that our current democratic processes and its machinery cannot deliver it. And so we must take it into our hands directly to make the changes needed to make it happen. And that is precisely what we are going to do. Kilda. Well, th thank you very much, Helmut. Um, uh, we had a talk um, from uh, uh, someone from New Democracy uh, a few months back, and um, she she made the point that uh, as a system, democracy is about creating uh, sort of social cohesion. Um, and um, I think you've you, you've you've restated that, but with um, uh, you know minor enhancing um, uh, and things like that added in. So um, that really resonates with me. Um, that's an interesting that's an interesting way to frame it. You know, um, uh, cohesion is important then as a um, as essential, obviously, in a stable society but I suspect you could find um, other forms of government historically that have been stable and cohesive without being democratic I, I think I think dem democracy offers us more than than cohesion but it's certainly if it's well if it's well operating it certainly offers us that yeah so I, I th you know my personal take on it is if you run the democracy well then you you're you're pooling all the knowledge in a community and um, uh, and all the different ways of knowing. And so, you know, the, the, there is the possibility of, of radical changes in the way you think about things and approach things. Um, so it's, it's not, um, I think you can have cohesion, but without, and it doesn't necessarily have to be all stable. <laughs> um, now, um, we have some questions. And I can see uh, Maureen's hand is up. Take your, your muted, Maureen. Unmute. Uh, kia ora, Helmut. Um, thank you for that. And I, although I haven't been involved in your process, I've, I've heard um, um, a lot about it from some people that are involved. And I think you're going a long way to develop relationships, trust, the, um, reciprocity. 
and I like the pace of the work that you're doing. I think too often um, organizations come in and they want a quick solution. And I think um, relationships in the community take time. So I, I was, my question is, how do you retain the integrity of the community kōrero or, and, or dialogue so that the voices inform public policy? And um, what, what do you think the success of deliberation um, in, in this um, place, space would look like? That's a great, that's a great. Uh, a couple of questions there. Um, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, that's all good. Um, so my personal opinion is that um, uh, as long as people feel like they have both a mechanism to have their voice heard and it is genuinely heard, um, most people are able to live with wherever they go. You know, uh, we're not used to, we're not raised to, and we're not used to getting everything we want. Um, but it is, it is uh, singularly frustrating when you have no ability to be heard or to influence, right? And so I, I think what, what, where I'm at in my head around um, our ability to maintain integrity around voices is that if we're creating um, through our talanoa and our wānana, uh, added channels for both representative voices, so that's through the community leadership who are representative of their constituency. So that's a channel for voices to be heard, as well as uh, a channel for direct voices through the Wanan or the Citizens Assembly. So that that adds to uh, two uh, additional channels of community voices. Um, um, being heard and being able to catalyze action that currently don't exist. And as long as we um, have processes for a respectful and a genuine uh, dialogue uh, in, in, in both of those processes, um, I think that would go quite a long way to, to strengthening uh, our citizens and our community's sense of being able to participate and make a difference because, of course, the thing that sucks the life out of, of us all democratically is when we, when we, you know, we feel like no matter what we say or do, it won't make a difference. I think that's part of the reason why our local government uh, elections are so poorly attended to people, you know, have little confidence that it will make a difference in their lives. And so it, it goes to both, I think, um, not only the process for being heard, but it then's got to flow into action, which is why I coupled not only the democratic bit, but the operationalizing bit. So how do we make sure things happen? And I guess just quickly, lastly, what I'll say about that is um, it is our intention, and I'm speaking on behalf of Ngāti Tōa, it is our intention to not be in the business of asking people for permission about how it is we want to live and how it is we want to improve our community. And if we have like-minded people in Purirua who, as we deliberate together, well, our intention is to just grow our own waka, just make it happen. Um, obviously, there'll be limits to, to, to what that can be, but you know, politicians, both local and central, are motivated by political capital. And if they see a community that's united, that's acting, that's willing to co-invest, uh, I, I feel confident that they will look to leverage and obtain some of the political capital by associating with and supporting things that are consistent with their, their platform. Anyway, I, I hope I've got some way to answer your question. Question. Thanks, Helmut. There, there, there's oh. one there from um, Tatiana, um, and it's about the, 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 the question or remit for the wānanga on climate change. Have you got to that yet? So, so all I know at this stage is we're going to put to the Palanoa that the first wānanga we run will be on the topic of climate change and what it is that we will do as a city and as a community here in Purirua to respond to the climate change emergency. 
and um, it, it will be you know, more refined than that. That's my version of it. And the the um, the team that is supporting us to implement us will 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 make sure that we're uh, getting the right expertise and advice on how to to um, run that run that that one and all that sort of thing. But that that's all we've got at this stage. Well, at least that's all I've got in my head. Is there any of the the um, the team here from uh, People Speak uh, that want to add to that? They can. I see you've got the thumbs up from Kelly uh, Helmut. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, David, I see your hand, but I, I, there's just a couple of questions in the chat and then we'll come to you, if that's okay. Yes. Yeah, sure. um, um, so, um, Helmut, can you see the chat? I, there's one from it's Annie like Gordon. It. I could read it out, but you can probably read it and just answer it directly. Um, uh, okay, so one I've got here is uh, one concern for me has been there would be in minority if it was demographically representative as such assemblies are overseas. Any thoughts about how to respond to those concerns? Yeah, so um, so I can't speak for all of you, but I can speak for Ngāti Toa. And uh, in one genuine sense, um, I know Ngāti Toa doesn't care what anybody else is planning on doing. Uh, what I mean by that is we, our, our aspiration is to do everything in our power to enhance the well-being, prosperity, and manao Ngāti Toa and all the people who live on our whenua and our right? That's, that's what occupies our mind, my mind, every day. And our strategy for executing that is, 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 we, is directly investing and rowing our own way. So we're going to make happen whatever we think we need to do to achieve that vision. And we're not ignoring, however, that there are a range of people who have statutory, contractual, ethical, or other obligations to support that journey. We're just not relying on anyone else to do their job really well. We're just going to make up on what we... And that's our version of Rangatiratam, right? However, in saying that, as we are going about trying to deliver directly on these outcomes for our people and community, we are unsurprisingly finding lots of people of goodwill, good smarts, capability who are similarly on a, on a similar journey that has a logical overlap. This is one. And so my point being is, we're happy to work with anyone, anyone on any specific uh, initiative that is logically consistent with or contributing to our threefold vision. This is one. Do, do we care if, if other people go off and do other things democratically or otherwise? People can do whatever they want. We're, we're trying to, to fill our space, be good partners, uh, uh, Row our own waka and support anyone, anyone who's doing likewise. So that's that's coming at that question from a broader perspective, but that's genuinely how we see it. Um, just going back to some of the other questions, do you want to pick some there? I, 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 yeah, I, I, I've been. It's been pointed out to me if I, I don't read them out or we don't read them out, then uh, the people in the recording won't know what the question was. <laughs> oh, okay. You go, you go. There. Uh, okay, well, I'm a terrible reader, but anyway. I've got my glasses on so I can at least see the words. Um, um, so thank you, Helmut. This is Annie's question. Thank you, Helmut, for articulating a process that is culturally authentic and inclusive of all voices in your rohi. This is so vital for Aotearoa to be generally representative of the multiple values and aspirations of our diverse citizens, uh, particularly in a way that is based in tikanga and in the lived lives and customs, cust traditions of our Pacific community. So that's more of a, a, a comment from Annie. Um, uh, so she's very appreciative. Just, I don't know if there's anything you want to pick up on that. Yeah, if I could just make a quick passing comment on that. A, a metaphor that came up in our, our workshop was the idea of a waka haurua. So the um, Pacific peoples, including the Māori people, Polynesian people of the Pacific, um, traversed the unreasonable distances of the Pacific using these double hulled waka, a waka haurua. And uh, it's the only uh, version of, a, of the waka that's uh, suitable for deep water. Uh, and and, and the, the, the idea that, that, that is a really strong metaphor for what 
how we're thinking about our Palanga Wananga, where one hull is the Tangata Finua, which Ngati Tuan Purirua is representative of, and the other hull is representative of the Tangatiriti or, the, or the, the rest of the community who are binding ourselves together in an authentic treaty based way, bringing the best of our collective cultural and experiential backgrounds to, to, to create our own waka haurua for the deep waters of our community and our society. So, I mean, I won't push the metaphor, but it's a good one. It's a good one. And that, that, that's, um, that's a reflection on Annie's comment here. Okay. Now, um, Kay, Kay had a question, but I see that's been answered in the chat. So we'll move down to Kelly's question. Um, so I'll read this out. Emperors and kings, then kings and dictators, now democracy v1, at the same time as democracy v1 has been the rise of unfettered capitalism, now having a profound effect on our politics and policies. Do you think that this evolution of democracy needs to be ex needs to explicitly address, take into account capitalism? Or will the process address this unto itself? I think the latter. So I, I, I think I think personally that the that the essential observation, I think the essential strength of what it is we're trying to accomplish together is to conceive and implement um, a stronger way for ensuring the universality of, of what we might call, you know, good outcomes. We use the language of well-being, prosperity, and mana. That's a reasonable shorthand that most people can relate to, right? Um, so our economic imperatives, you know, communism lost the war, uh, uh, socialism's finding, uh, fighting a, a rearguard action, uh, but capitalism's undoubted aggregate productive power uh, is, is carrying the day, but it, it's been, um, it's, it's distributive deficiencies, its inability to ensure um, the cohesion that you alluded to, Simon, um, is the unanswered question that still vexes us all. Now, there's no question that in aggregate, um, you know, uh, capitalism uh, delivers the goods. We've got all the evidence we need for that, but it's the distribution um, problem that is vexing us all. And I'm simply of a view that our strength and vision to and beyond ways of organizing ourselves will make our own decisions on not just, you know, production or economic imperatives, but everything. Um, it's a much bigger conversation if we want to talk about capitalism, but that would be my short response to that. that would be. I'll look forward to talking to you further about that, Kelly. Okay, um, David, uh, you you had your hand up before. Would you like to put a question yeah, to Helmut? Well, well, thanks, Helmut. Well, thanks, everyone, by the way. Um, I guess I'm trying to get my head around this. Um, I have colleagues, they're Pacifica colleagues, actually, very well-known Pacifica people around Wellington, actually. One of, them, one of them has worked at a fairly high level in the health sector. He guarantees to me that, for example, there is racism in the health sector. I personally, as a white guy, I doubt it. I've worked in education. I don't see racism in education, for example, but in both health and in education, we see differential outcomes. And we know that Murray and Pacifica tend to do less well than others in both health and in education. And in health, you could say, well, that could be a policy failure or in education, it might be a policy failure. But on the other hand, in health, you might have lifestyle choices and genetics and so on and so forth. Do you see differential outcomes helmet as always arising from a policy failure or do you think uh there could be other reasons yeah, is it no, always is it always a failure policy maybe it always is if there are differential outcomes then no. something has gone wrong right at the at the get-go that should have been fixed or should be fixed at some later point in time yeah no look that's a very very good question and i have absolutely no hesitation in saying that the quality of outcomes is impossible without tyranny. All right. Um, you 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 can have 
are the same number of people in one family with uh, available to them all the same resources, up values, gene pool, and the variation in outcomes is, is all over the place. No, 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 outcomes, variation in outcomes isn't the issue. The, the, the issue is whether or not there are systemic uh, drivers of inequality, and, and, and particularly at the beginning of that cycle on, on, the, on the opportunity end, right? I, I guess I'd just make, and this is a big conversation, and I'd love to have it with you sometime, but quick observation I'd make around it is this. If you go to Waitangi, uh, Waitangi House, Treaty House, there, there was a book in there, the first time I went to Waitangi in the 80s, and I read this book in there, and it was opened up on a particular page where the earlier, uh, earliest arrivals uh, who'd written this book were describing the extraordinary, um, uh, in their words, the extraordinary characteristics of the New Zealanders that they encountered. And they were describing the physical prowess, the mental acuity that was evidenced by the, the ability of the New Zealanders to recite endless complex genealogies and other things. And basically it was, they were describing this impressive physical and, 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 and mental uh, capabilities of the, these native people that, that the English had encountered. Well, you, you wouldn't use that language to describe on average the um, physical uh, or otherwise uh, condition of, of the descendants of those people. In, in, in 1900, um, when my quarter was born shortly thereafter, 3% of the prison population was, um, was Māori. Uh, today it's over 50%. In the in the 1920s, when the Native Schools Act was implemented, and I heard on the radio an old scratchy recording of the Minister of the Native Schools say that the purpose of the Native Schools Act is to educate the Native to his proper station in life. To the boys it is to be farmers, and to the girls it is to be the wives of farmers. I could go on and on and on uh, around both the uh, treaty breach, uh, breach uh, contributors to the impoverishment of, of Maori people, the public policy settings that have contributed to that deteriorating situation. All of that is pretty well uh, documented, but it's all in the past. And there's not a single thing we can do about it, not a single thing other than learn from it. And so to my mind, the lesson to learn is uh, uh, is in line with the sorts of thinking and conversation we're having now about how do we leverage better our collective wisdom, get participation, engage the community and so forth. That, that's the journey in front of us, which I'm, I'm excited by. But those wider questions of genetic, social, public policy contributors to current outcomes, David, big conversation, but I think you've got the flavor of my thoughts. And I just make, I don't want to hog the conversation, but thank you for that. That's, that's a, a very helpful sort of insight. But, um, you know, in so many areas where you have d disparate outcomes, socioeconomics is a key driver. And I, I've worked personally in, in quantitative research as a statistician in the health sector and various other sectors, and also in the education sector. And we've done our best in education to try to identify exactly what it is that leads to some demographic groups underperforming relative to others. And for example, in the case of Marion Pacifica, but also in the case of minorities in other countries, I've done a lot of this analysis and other people have done it too. Um, if you look at ethnicity as a predictor, it seems uh, on, on the, at the outset that that might be the biggest explainer of disparities, but in fact, it actually isn't. And it's socioeconomics. And if you do the regression analyses and so forth, uh, and you throw in all these predictors, Ethnicity in, for Maori and Pacifica turns out not to be so important as a predictor as socioeconomic. So it's living in a deprived household and all the rest of that. So in other words, the policy fix is not so much within education or, or health, although there may, may be fixes there as well. The policy fix is more around distribution of wealth and, and socioeconomics. So that's just a quick oh, thought. Oh, one last thing on this one, one last thing on this. So without exception, social policy concerns itself with multifactoral problems. Yeah. I mentioned health, right? Only 18% of the literature is still there, there or thereabouts uh, of, of um, health and well-being is determined by the access to quality health services. 
over 80% of it is actually through, you know, wider social determinants that even if you've got a perfect health system, you've got 80 plus percent of the drivers of well-being got nothing to do with it, right? So multifactorial complex. And at the, at the heart of it, though, it's about change, people change, right? And so mm -hmm. what we know categorically is that change is hard, first point, and, and second, that you can't do change to people, right? You can't, you can't talk someone into it. You can't, they've got to choose it. They've got to want it. And then there's got to be a realistic pathway to achieve the change. And when it's multifactorial, then it's, that's the hardest time. And so that means usually, and we've all experienced this, how did that last diet go? How did that last gym membership go, right? Change is hard. So the point I'm making is that we do have a, a subset of, of population sub populations in our community who have a significant development imperative, change imperative, and nobody can do that to them. Nobody. This comes back to my observation about the key lesson from the last two years. If we, if, if the wider community, which did include the Māori community, hadn't uh, of our own volition acted to make happen in our community for ourselves and the wider community we serve, right? Nothing would have changed any different in terms of the, the penetration of that and all the rest of it. So that's why I come back to the observation. Inform, empower, involve, and resource the community, whether it's the, the, the Māori community, the Pacific community, all the poor folks, whatever, the community. And that's why the power of this Helena Wananga to inform, engage, and empower and ultimately secure resource to and to 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 and Nick has got a lot of potential. A lot of potential. Wow. Thank, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Helmut. Um, I think that's a really powerful vision for um, the work that is underway in Porirua. And you know, whatever we learn from it, I think will be um, of huge benefit to. Uh, not the, just the people here, and because I live in Porirua too, but uh, I think across um, Aotearoa uh, and and beyond. Um, so we, we'll, we'll we'll keep our aspirations modest, um, but we certainly are hopeful that in our little safe to fail experiment we can learn some good things and uh, and and go from. If I could just dodge you to just leave one last thing with you, uh, Simon. So um, again, excuse me for the for the metaphor, but if you have a flood in your laundry, you've got two jobs. You've got to mop and you've got to turn off the water. If you don't turn off the water, you're mopping a long time, a long time. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that for a range of systemic reasons, both central and local government are moppers. They're in the business of mopping. And that it's only and this is connected with the observations I was just making. It's only the community, informed, empowered, and resourced, can turn off the tap, can turn off the water. And so that's my, that's our vision. That's our vision. Told everyone, good to be with you. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you finish off your uh, AGM unless there was anything else. I'm going to go play basketball with my nephews now. <laughs> Thank, thanks a million, Helmut. That, you, that was absolutely wonderful. Tough one. All righty. Good. All power to you all. Good, everyone. Thank you.